Welcome to part two of this computing lecture in which we will look at algorithms, software engineering, machine learning and the web. So let's take an example of genome sequencing. DNA sequencing can only deal with relatively short stretches of DNA, somewhere between 800 and 2,000 bases maximum, depending on the method that you're using. How do we deal then with sequencing entire genomes? Well, what we do is break the DNA into fragments, sequence those, and then look for overlapping regions to join them into a continuous sequence. We need to enforce some sort of minimum overlap size because obviously if we only overlapped one base, given that there are four different bases, there's a one in four chance that uh, we would have a match. So having a minimum overlap size reduces the probability of a match by chance. We also need to have some sort of fuzzy matching to account for errors in the sequencing. So the uh, sequencing methods tend to be more prone to errors at the ends of a sequence, and that, of course, is the region that we wish to overlap. So we can use some sort of confidence score by combining the size of the overlap with the uh, accuracy of the overlap, the number of matches that we have, uh, in order to uh, have a confidence that this match is correct. There are also problems with sequence repeats because of how much you end up overlapping. So let's um, take a look at a, a string of, of text, uh, and it's been split into overlapping fragments. So what we do is start by looking at the start of one of these fragments to see if it matches the end of anything else. And we get a match here. Of course, there was also a match here with just the S space A, but this is a longer match uh, and therefore more likely to be correct. So we join those and we continue doing that basically until we have run out of bits to match. And at this stage, uh, we can now look at the end of this segment and see if it matches anything else, which it does here. And so we join this into this one passage from Shakespeare's As You Like It. So what about an algorithm for doing that? Well, what is an algorithm, first of all? Uh, I like to define it as a complete and precise set of steps that will solve a problem and achieve an identical result whenever given the same set of data to a defined level of accuracy. So three main points to that, ordered steps, it's repeatable, and we have a known or defined accuracy. And that's because we may do things like use uh, random numbers in solving our, our problem, so the, we may not end up with an absolutely identical uh, result, but we know that it will be identical at some level of accuracy. So what about doing that for fragment assembly? Well, basically what we do is choose one of the strings of text, S1, and at the start we say for each other string of text, S2, if the start of S1 equals the end of S2, then we combine the two together. So we're taking uh, S2 plus S1, but we're removing the uh, overlap from one of these, and then calling that the new string S1. And we go back to the start. And we keep looping around until we've run out of strings. If there's more than one string left at the end of all this, then we repeat the above, but we match the end of string S1 with the start of string S2. So that was the match uh, where we're looking at the sequences the other way around. So software engineering then is the process of turning that algorithm into something that the computer can actually understand. And we do that using computer programming. And really this becomes an essential skill for any level of advanced bioinformatics. It allows us to automate tasks, to manipulate data, to do our own advanced analysis of data, and to create tools for doing things like making predictions. 
programming languages are used because we rarely write directly in instructions understood by a computer. Now this used to be something that was done quite a lot for games programming, but even that now tends to use uh, libraries of, of routines that have been done at that very low level uh, to make it much easier to write uh, new games. So we use what's called a high-level language, and there are many, many of these. Uh, here's just a little selection with probably the most popular ones uh, in bioinformatics shown in Orange, C, Perl, and Python, um, with JavaScript also being very popular, but this is a specialized language generally just used within web pages. Uh, things like C++ and Java are also popular, and languages like Fortran are popular in certain areas that have come more from chemistry and physics, so things like molecular dynamics. And then there are all sorts of other languages, and this is just a very small uh, sample of those. Now, I think most of you will have had some experience of Python, so we're going to look at a different language called Perl, uh, which really used to be the most popular language for doing bioinformatics up until maybe five to ten years ago. Now, Perl has certain advantages, Python has certain advantages. Uh, my particular preference really is for Perl. So I'm just going to take you through um, doing a little exercise with, with Perl, uh, where we'll look at this again in uh, more detail later. But this is just a simple kind of idea that we have a table uh, containing uh, amino acid names and two columns of numbers. Now, suppose that uh, all we're interested in is the amino acid name and the second column of numbers. We want to get rid of this column. And here's a bit of Perl that would do that. So what we're doing here is this statement simply allows us to loop through a file. So it looks at each line in turn from the file. And what we're doing then is splitting each line into the three columns. So uh, when we first enter this bit of code, we will read the first line from the file. We will split this into three columns, alanine 21.4, 18.3, and then we will print the va value from column one and the value from column three. And this backslash n means a new line, move on to the next line. So we'll print ala. 18.3, then we will loop round again, read the next line, do the same here, and then here, and then here, and then we've run out of stuff in the file, so we'll end this while loop. So the result looks like this. Now, of course, you can do the same in Python and many other languages, but actually, I think the Perl implementation is one of the easiest ways of doing it, because we don't have to worry about things like actually opening a file to read, closing it at the end, and so on. Now, this all looks a bit of a mess. It looks quite complicated. But all this is doing is implementing that algorithm for uh, joining those, those bits of text together. So it's effectively a very simple um, assembly program for assembling overlapping uh, sequence fragments. Now, all this stuff on the right after the hash marks uh, is uh, just comments. So you can kind of ignore the right-hand side of this. Uh, and uh, you can see that a lot of this is just curly brackets, um, which rather than the tabs that you use in Python, we use curly brackets to uh, show a block of, of code that is run together. Uh, and you can see then that there's, what, about 20, 25 lines of code to do that. It's quite a difficult problem. Now let's move on to another very important topic in bioinformatics, which is data mining and machine learning. Now, data mining is the idea of extracting patterns, relationships, and meanings from data. This is used very extensively like by people like supermarkets. That's why you have a loyalty card to look at your buying patterns. 
it also enables supermarkets then to uh, look at um, what things people tend to buy together. So, for example, uh, if one finds that people tend on a Friday night to buy beer and crisps, then they'll put the beer and the crisps at opposite ends of the supermarket to make sure that you have to walk through the supermarket and possibly do some other impulse buys at the same time. So, for example, where might we use this in bioinformatics? Well, extracting sequence patterns or rules characteristic of a protein family in order to create a secondary data bank. Machine learning, then, is a general class of computer software which learns from examples and is then able to make predictions. And that process of learning from examples will often generate patterns, and those patterns are what can be used in data mining. So what we do in machine learning, then, is to train a machine learning method with examples of real data. For example, um, bits of uh, windows of sequence, amino acid sequence, and the output would be whether the middle uh, amino acid in that window was in an alpha helix or a beta strand or in neither. So you would train it with lots of examples like that. The method learns the features of those real examples and then you can apply the trained system to make predictions. In this case, you'd give it a window of amino acids and it would predict whether the central residue uh, was uh, an alpha in, in an alpha helix or a beta strand or neither. There are many such methods, things like neural networks, support vector machines, decision trees, naive Bayesian classifiers, uh, the, the list goes on and on and on. But neural networks are a very popular method and have really seen quite a resurgence over the last few years with this idea of deep learning where we have uh, much more complicated neural networks than the early ones and you will learn more about these in uh, later lectures. But the basic idea of a neural network is that we arrange many interconnected perceptrons uh, also called neurodes in multiple interconnected layers. So we have some sort of input layer uh, which is where we could uh, put in for example our sequence information. We then have one or more hidden layers and then we have an output layer which uh, in our simple example of secondary structure prediction this could be uh, alpha helix, this could be beta strand, and if neither of them is uh, activated, then we would say that we were not in either helix or strand. So this window would be your uh, window of five amino acids, this would be your, your output. And what happens during the training of the neural network is that it learns weights to put on each of these connections. So you'll see that each of these input nodes is connected to one of the hidden nodes, each of the hidden nodes is connected to one of the output nodes. So each of these nodes is a very simple mathematical operator. It takes a set of inputs, in this case three, but it could be uh, any number, depending on how many nodes there were pre in the previous layer of the network. Uh, and we learn these weights. So the output then from this node is some function of little a, the weight, times big A, the input, plus little b times big B, plus little c times big C. So during the training, basically we take our network like this, and we're looking at the um, outputs from the network to see whether they match the outputs that we're expecting. And by tweaking all these weights, we're able to optimize that match. As I said, machine learning is a very common tool in bioinformatics these days. It's used in all sorts of things, from signal peptide prediction through to secondary structure prediction. And these are a, a few uh, examples of secondary structure prediction software and their authors. And of course, the big news uh, in the last year 
uh, is the AlphaFold 2 uh, approach, which um, has been used for predicting the three-dimensional structure of proteins uh, by using this deep learning, these uh, neural networks that have multiple layers, multiple uh, hidden layers uh, involved in them. And as I said, you'll learn more about that uh, later in the course. Okay, that's coming back to, uh, so we talked about uh, algorithms and software, coming back to the computers and networking. Uh, how does this work and what, what do we do? Well, computers used to be networked together like this. We would have maybe one server containing uh, data and we would have lots of individual desktop machines and they were all daisy chained together like this uh, with links between them. And those would then connect to some sort of router and onto the rest of the internet. Now, of course, the problem with this is that if you disconnect one of these computers from this daisy chain, then you break the chain. These, if we disconnected this one, then these would no longer be able to see the server and uh, these would no longer be able to see the internet. Um, so you had uh, boxes on a wall quite often with a, a little kind of uh, loop of cable that you could put in if you disconnected the computer. It also meant, of course, that each computer needed two wires going to it. So really this approach hasn't been used for some time now. Uh, instead, we take this sort of approach, uh, which is a kind of star-like topology, where we have uh, a switch and... Uh, the server is connected to that switch, each individual computer is connected to that switch using a single cable and uh, this uh, switch also connects out to a router and out to the internet. And this means of course if you disconnect one of the computers it has no effect on the others. What do we use networking for? Well locally we can use it for sharing files, things like um, NFS is a sort of Unix Linux uh, network uh, file sharing system and SMB is the system that's used by Windows. We also use it for auth authentication so when you log on to uh, one of the uh, UCL uh, computer cluster machines uh, then you are using a, a system that is then looking up your username and password uh, on the local system. Remotely we use it again for sharing files, so uh, FTP, File Transport Protocol, is the general way of, of sharing large files or large numbers of files. Gopher is an old-fashioned way that really isn't used anymore. So this was kind of a precursor of the web in which uh, rather than websites you had gopher holes um, and this was all kind of text-based, no kind of pretty graphical browsers or anything. We have email, of course. Um, News groups, these really uh, aren't used very much now since the development of, of websites. We can use um, network for sharing linked documents. Uh, and this uses a protocol known as HTTP, Hypertext Transport Protocol. Uh, and this is really what underlies the web. We can use the network to access remote con computers so things like Telnet which again that's not really used anymore because uh, it's not secure uh, and these days we tend to use SSH secure shell instead. So these allow you to log into uh, another computer or server somewhere else. And remote processing also known as RPC uh, so this allows you uh, essentially to run bits of code on other people's computers. So you probably gathered from that, and this is, uh, this is an important distinction, that the internet is not the same thing as the web. The web is just one application of the internet. Uh, and I've already talked about these things, but you know, the internet uh, consists of many things, such as the web, FTP, news, remote procedure calling, remote access, email, and so on. So when we enter an address into something like a web browser, that has to be converted into a number. 
because each computer on the internet has a unique IP address. This is IP stands for Internet Protocol. Now that's not completely true because uh, on a local network, local, particularly a local home network, uh, your computers uh, will sit behind what's known as a NAT box. That's um, Network Address Translation. And this means that uh, there's a range of internet uh, protocol addresses, IP addresses, that are reserved for you to use locally. And then the NAT function, in, which is usually in your router, converts that in such a way that the rest of the internet only sees the address of your router. So this is an example of an IP address, something like 128.40.46.27. Now, of course, numbers are difficult to remember. So what we tend to do is use a hierarchical domain name. So something like www.biochem.ucl.ac.uk. And that name has to be mapped to a number using what's known as a domain name service. So this is really just like a phone directory um, which maps your names to the numbers that you want to look up. The World Wide Web itself was invented by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research. It was initially designed for sharing text documents within CERN and of course now uh, supports graphics, sound, video, animations uh, and of course the ability to send data to a server uh, through some sort of query form as well as to get data from the server. Now Tim Berners-Lee, now Sir Tim Berners-Lee of course is British. The World Wide Web is a British invention. The internet however uh, was derived from something called DARPA or DARPANET which was um, developed in the US. So remembering what I said about names and addresses, IP addresses, when we go to a particular site on the web what has to happen is this. You enter a URL onto your computer in your web browser. That URL, which will contain a name of a particular server, like google.com, um, that name has to be sent to what's called a DNS server, and the DNS server returns the IP address. Once you have the IP address, you can then connect to the web server. You send a request for a particular page to that web server, the web server sends the page back to the client and the client is able to display it. The connection to the web server can then be closed. But then what happens is that the client scans the document for things like embedded images or that sort of thing. And it repeats that connection and request process for each embedded item in turn and eventually you get your full document displayed. Now of course all those connections and everything happens very fast, uh, at least assuming you're not still on a, a telephone dial-up type connection, and so you don't really see all those, those steps happening. When we look at a URL, something like this, um, we have different parts to that URL. The first part is the protocol, typically HTTP or FTP, or these days HTTPS, which is a secure version of HTTP, so that the data are all encrypted. Uh, and uh, then we have the domain name, which is the name of the computer that you want to access. That's what gets looked up using a DNS server to find the IP address. We then have a directory on the server and a specific file name. So if we do a URL like this, in this particular example, then the assumption uh, by the system will be that that last bit of the name will actually be a file. 
it will find in this case that it isn't a file so it will try again as a directory and it will look in that directory for something called generally index.html uh, and if that exists it will return that. In this example by putting a slash on the end we're telling the uh, web browser that this is definitely a directory so it will know to look for the index.html. Now the web has evolved hugely since uh, it started and actually the web and bioinformatics have really grown up as technologies together. So if you are a Perl programmer and you're writing a web server that is taking data that's been entered by a user onto a form on uh, an HTML page and you're doing some processing of those data, maybe putting them in a database or uh, pulling out results from a database or doing some calculations, you'll typically use a Perl module, uh, so a bit of a pre-written Perl code called CGI.PM uh, and that was written by somebody called Linkenstein who is a bioinformatician. So an awful lot of web servers used to rely on this code written by a bioinformatics person. And really bioinformatics has often been quite a driving force behind web development and has been used as a test system for many developments. E-commerce hasn't really uh, been driven by bioinformatics at all uh, but has been driven by other things, largely, to be honest, pornography and the uh, desire to be able to sell that over the internet. And that's what really led to the explosion in shopping uh, over the internet with uh, things like Amazon and these days pretty much every other major shop having a web presence. So in summary, computing really is central to bioinformatics. We've talked about data structures and information retrieval uh, and in particular the idea of storing data in relational databases. We've talked about algorithms, how to solve a problem, software engineering, how to implement a problem that has been described by an algorithm, and data mining and machine learning. Finally, we talked about networking and uh, transferring data between places and the internet. So further reading I would recommend uh, the LESC Introduction to Bioinformatics. The example of the genome assembly uh, came from his book and the, uh, the little bit of Perl code that I showed you is actually reproduced from that. Um, I would also recommend of course the Arango Jones and Thornton uh, course textbook. Uh, and also point out that there are various books now available on programming specifically for bioinformatics using bioinformatics examples. So it really helps when you're learning to program if you've got examples that are relevant to you rather than uh, completely made up examples that you don't really see the relevance of. Uh, so there are books on Perl programming, Python programming and so on. Now we will come back to topics of programming and databases in more detail in the next lecture.